Hey, my name is King. If you don't know who I am, my name is Israel King. I'm a writer, director, and anime commentator on my main channel, King Tannic. Now, if you've been a fan of pop culture for any amount of time, then you surely must have noticed the sudden rise in popularity in anime and manga. Films breaking box office records, series topping the most pirated show of the year chart, and of course, the very apparent fan base that has surrounded it. According to a poll back in February of this year, about 50% of Gen Z watches anime. Now, if you're not Gen Z, it can be kind of hard not knowing anything about this new, sudden, very popular corner in the pop culture zeitgeist. And that's where we come in. King Tanik and the Burn Network have partnered to bring you the best anime and manga related news show on YouTube. The Otaku Experience is your go-to place to find out the biggest stories of the week in the anime and manga industry. Still not convinced? Try the show out for yourself. The show airs Thursdays at 2 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time or 5 p.m. Eastern. The Otaku Experience, only on the Burn Network. Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it's I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your archbishop of Banterbury, your evangelist of the imagination, and the still-as-yet-undefined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. And this is Rob's Evasions, episode number 865. <sighs> You know, I'd like to read you something. I'd like to read you something to begin with. And uh, it's from Shakespeare's Macbeth. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying Nothing. Quite a passage to take the episode title of this week's Strange New Worlds episode from, right? And, you know, I'll tell you, I would have thought perhaps maybe how interesting that somebody cited this particular passage from Macbeth for the title of a Star Trek episode. Oh, if it hadn't already been done in the original series. The penultimate episode of Star Trek the original series from the 1968-69 episode, All Our Yesterdays, is also from this exact same passage of Macbeth. Which shouldn't be surprising, because there is not one shred of originality in Strange New Worlds, down to the fucking episode titles. Which is saddening. And I kind of wonder now, this episode was written by a chap, um, you know, I, I'm sure he's a very nice fellow, a Canadian writer who began his writing career writing sequels to uh, Lake Placid. And, you know, hey, look, I, that, that's fine. I'm not going to, anybody who, um, you know, anybody who gets a job writing anything in this industry deserves to be lauded for doing something great. This man's name is David Reed. And I have to say, to be fair, he writes episodes of The Boys, and I love that show. It's just disappointing when I have to look at an episode title of a Star Trek episode and go, oh, we're now even recycling passages from Shakespeare. Isn't there a lot of Shakespeare, enough of Shakespeare, that you didn't have to cite a passage already cited in the original series, but then you think to yourself, no. No, there's not. Because they are trying to, well, they're not trying to, they're, they are 
They are erasing the original series, which from a business standpoint and from a, uh, I don't know, a moral, a philosophical, but mostly a business standpoint, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to take something that is continually, make, continually making money for you, even to this day? Um, more money than, uh, in terms of merchandising than any of the other shows have made. I would very much like to compare the sales figures, especially in physical media, of new and modern Star Trek with that of older Star Trek. Um, we recently had Star Trek Prodigy canceled by Paramount Plus and then taken down. I mean, unless you get the physical media, maybe you can watch it somewhere else. And the irony of that is there is an argument to be made that Prodigy was the best of the modern Star Trek shows uh, in terms of its episodic nature. Um, I didn't like it because it didn't focus on human characters. And I think by definition, Star Trek needs to focus on human characters. Sure, you interact with alien characters and you can have alien characters as principles. But for the most part, it focuses on humanity. And once you start making your principal characters non-human characters, is it still Star Trek or is it something else? I mean, sure, it can take place. You can do anything you want in the Star Trek universe. But um, anyway, so this episode, uh, this week's episode of Strange New Worlds is called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And I'm going to spoil the shit out of it, just so you know. I'm going to spoil it all. But before I get there... Uh, I want to talk about a few things about the nature of a franchise and in terms of its... One of the things that I th I think, personally, that attracts people to these fictionalized universes, whether it's the Game of Thrones, whether it's Westeros, whether it's Lord of the Rings, whether it's Doctor Who, whether it's Star Trek, these in endearing and enduring franchises that have lasted for many decades is that there is a sense of history built into them. Uh, the original series, of course, ran from 66 to 69. And then, of course, Next Generation debuted in 1987. And then, of course, we had the classic Star Trek films in between, the animated series in 73 and 74, and countless novels and countless... How many TV shows had reference manuals or technical manuals or spaceflight chronologies or just chronologies or stellar star charts all of these things were manufactured to service the star trek fans of the world and many people slaved over them to make them correct the akuta's two volume hardcover star trek encyclopedia essential for any star trek fan star trek novelists have spent the beginnings of their careers, usually they use Star Trek novels as a stepping stone. Some are content to just write Star Trek novels. But the best of the Star Trek novelists use canon and extrapolate. And when you, when you extrapolate, a novelist has to think about ten different things. Many more things than a TV writer has to think about. So you wind up getting, um, like if you read the best of the Star Trek novels, like I'll give you an example. If you don't want to read a bunch, take David Mack. David Mack wrote two mirror, well, he wrote some short stories too, but he wrote two mirror universe novels. He wrote a book called Sorrows of Empire, and he wrote a book called Rise Like Lions. And it basically deals with the mirror universe after the first mirror, uh, mirror universe episode, Mirror Mirror, from the second season of the original series. And then it takes it on and up through the next generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager era. If you like the mirror universe and you're a Star Trek fan, I cannot recommend those books highly enough. What was great, though, about those books is there's so much extrapolation about the nature of the mirror universe that's done in David Mack's writing. And in fact, in all of his Star Trek writing, uh, David Mack might very well be the best of the modern Star Trek novelists, especially in terms of his grasp of lore. Um, and, and, you know, the Reeve Stevens are some of my favorite Star Trek writers in terms of novels. Um, and, and I would say David Mack sort of took their, th their, their throne only because they stopped writing Star Trek novels after William Shatner and, and took, took it forward. Other great writers of Star Trek that are writing today still, Christopher Bennett, Dayton Ward, uh, there's a lot. But what's great about Star Trek novels, why I like them, is because they felt legitimate. They felt like I was reading something that for me as a diehard Star Trek fan, I felt that I was reading something 
where the people writing it grokked Star Trek, grokked all of it. Grok is something that comes from the Robert Heinlein novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. I'll let you discover it yourself, what it means. But I used to wear a pin in junior high school that said, I grok Spock. Um, but anyway, it was, it was gratifying to read these books because the Star Trek novelists, the best of the novelists, just like Khan was the best of the tyrants, the best of the novelists really understood Star Trek the way that I imagined it to be, which was I took it very seriously. And like all of the great fictional universes, even though Star Trek was written by a bunch of different people, and you can talk about the inconsistencies in Star Trek all day long. When did the United Earth Space Probe Agency become Starfleet? When did the United Federation of Planets happen? I get all of that. But what's really interesting is when I was watching that at the time, I didn't bump on those things because you were learning about the universe. You weren't, none of that was established yet. So it's not like we talk about everything that's happening in our world at the, at the same time, you talk about what needs to come up in conversation. You know, I might talk about the local police force, and then I might talk about the FBI and the CIA, but I wouldn't necessarily talk about them all in the same all at the same time when I need to call the police. You know, so the more we learned about things in the Star Trek universe from episode to episode to episode, and they were finding their way. The original series, nobody they weren't considering that would have the fan base it had. They were just trying to write an episodic TV show. They were always under the gun. They always were not doing, they were not number one in the ratings, but they were trying to write the best show that they could, which is what every television show tries to do. But unlike every other TV show, when somebody makes a new TV show of Star Trek now, they have 57 years of lore and history to look back on. Now, there is this weird thing, and I've talked about it before, where I don't know where this came from. And even some of my favorite Star Trek novelists like Greg Cox, some of the great comic book writers as well that have worked on the franchise, have this idea that Star Trek is supposed to be our world. Our world now. Which I've never understood that because even as a kid watching Star Trek, which Star Trek would come back in time to the present day, 1966, 1967, like in Tomorrow is Yesterday. I knew that the Starship Enterprise really didn't go back in time. I started watching Star Trek in syndication. So I understood that the Starship Enterprise, because it wasn't real, it didn't come back to our world, the world that I was watching Star Trek on television. And how did I know that Star Trek wasn't from our world? Because I was watching a TV show called Star Trek, which immediately made me as a five-year-old understand that, oh... While the Star Trek universe shares many similarities with our universe, it's not our universe. I knew that there was no orbiting nuclear platform that um, the Enterprise had to figure out, well, how do we survive this era in the second season ending episode, the, the last episode of the second season, uh, Assignment Earth, which was also a backdoor pilot. And of course, in, in, for a series that never happened, all these writers are doing in, since 2009 is going back and, and planting their flag on previously established Star Trek lore, which I wouldn't have a problem with if it's not done so ham-fistedly, haphazardly, hack-kneed. None of it is any good. I, there has not been one change to the Star Trek universe since 2009, even though I know that took place in a blowing up the Romulan homeworld, which is supposed to be canonical. Why would you do that? Then blowing up Vulcan. I know it was an alternate universe, but why would you do that? Like, uh, why would you fundamentally change the Guardian? Here, here, there are things in Discovery. They decided to go back and reestablish Harlan Ellison's original script for City on the Edge of Forever that had been adapted into an IDW comic book and retcon the original show. Why? Why do the writers, first of all, feel the need or the right to do that? I, 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 I honestly don't understand. And the thing was, if they had given me a Ron Moore, Battle, uh, David Icke, Battlestar Galactica reboot of Star Trek from the beginning, from scratch, I would have said, okay. Thing is, it still would have been awful because the writing across the board in Star, modern Star Trek, it defines hackneyed. 
They can't figure out what, what story they're going to tell. And, and this is no fault of the actors or the technical people, uh, the effects people. I don't like the style of effects in Strange New Worlds, but the actors, I think, are pretty good. The casts have all been pretty good. They're just given really shitty scripts that they have to say. Um, they try as hard as they can, though. It's just, and, and this is, you know, I look at David Reed, and I want to ask him, I want to sit him down and go, dude, you didn't just try and sequelize one episode of Star Trek. You tried to sequelize like 20 over multiple shows. And none of it makes a lick of sense, really. And I understand people, I mean, from a, from a storytelling standpoint, you had a great idea. Well, first of all, let's talk about the character of La Noonien Singh, played by Christina Chong. I love Christina Chong's portrayal of La'an Nooney and Singh. La'an is a great character, and she does a great job. She's beautiful. I think she's a great actress. She's playing the part as, as if she's, um, I don't know, another alien to be dealt with. But, but here's it, it, the conception of the character. She is supposed to be a descendant of Khan Nooney and Singh. They make a big deal about it. And if she truly was a descendant of Khan Noonien and Singh, she would be she would have genetically altered DNA. Um, how does she survive three hundred years after the eugenics wars? Now, let me let me just share a little bit of uh, uh, a bit of some stuff here, so I can explain what it is that uh, I'm talking about. What are the eugenics wars? All right. The eugenics wars, the concept of the eugenics wars was introduced in the very first season of Star Trek, the 66-67 season of Star Trek in the episode Space Seed, which also introduced Khan, Noonie, and Singh. Uh, this from Memory Alpha. The eugenics wars, or the Great Wars, were a series of conflicts fought on Earth between 1992 and 1996 and during the 21st century, a.k.a. as the eugenic war the Second Civil War, and World War III, according to Strange New Worlds. So, Strange New Worlds has already tried to retcon the idea of the eugenics wars. But here's the thing. The first season of Star Trek is immutable. You have to go by what they say in the first season of Star Trek, because that everything stems from that. If nothing else, the first season, or actually, well, the first season, but... All three seasons of the original Star Trek should be considered sacrosanct. They're immutable. They are Star Trek history. Everything must come from that because that's how it was created by Gene Roddenberry and his collaborators, Gene Kuhn, Dorothy Fontana, David Gerald, other people that wrote those episodes, directed the episodes. So it doesn't make much sense to go back and start playing with that. And the eugenics wars were, Khan ruled a quarter of the world's population between 1992 and and 1996. That happened. And um, here's another thing with the timeline. All right, so Khan and 96 of his followers escaped in the Botany Bay, escaped Earth, and left to go find somewhere else. And the Botany Bay was discovered 300 years later, or 300 years plus, when Khan says on Earth 200 years ago, I was a prince with power over millions. That's, he's just saying he's rounding down. But so in 1996, Khan and his followers left Earth. Well, here's the thing. In order to be in the right place at the right time, the Botany Bay had to have traveled for a certain amount of time, three centuries, to be discovered by the Enterprise in space seed. And 15 years later, Khan was, of course, marooned on SETI Alpha 5. And what happened on SETI Alpha 5 great miniseries by Nicholas Meyer that is apparently going to be turned into a podcast, but the SETI Alpha 5 miniseries, the three-night event, must read. I've read it. It's quite good. In my mind, it's canonical. But the thing is, unless that happened, the Botany Bay would not be able to travel far enough to get to the rendezvous point where it meets the Enterprise and Space Seed, which means Star Trek II can't happen. And the idea that Lon, Nooney, and Singh, imagine if you were a child of, say, Hitler. You know, you were Brunhilde Hitler. That was your name. Um, would you keep that last name? And if you were a relative of Hitler's after World War II, what might, ha what might happen to you when the Russians swarmed into Berlin? So the idea that there is a character named Lon, Nooney, and Singh who is haunted by the fact that 
300 years ago, her ancestor was ruler of a quarter of the world's population. Now, here's what's interesting, too, that drives me insane. Khan, as we know in Space Seed, was the best of the tyrants. People were not tortured under his rule, his authoritarian rule. And, um, you know, they talk about that, and, and, and Spock says, gentlemen, gentlemen, and our main characters, Scotty, Kirk, McCoy, they admire Khan. They admire Khan because he wasn't some megalomaniacal Pol Pot dictator that was exterminating human beings. And the reason that he was attacked, I mean, he probably had a lot of infighting. We learned from other episodes of Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, that there were other tyrants around the world. Because, as Spock said in the episode, superior ability breeds superior ambition. So that's an interesting period of time. 300 years ago, to make a character that is a descendant of Khan Noonien Sings, let's say you were a descendant of somebody 300 years ago. Uh, would that be a problem for anyone? I mean, even if you had the genetic augmentation that apparently Lon's great, 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 great grandparents had, if there was intermarriages and people were getting married to non-genetically altered people, which I would imagine there weren't very many left on Earth, uh, there eventually whatever whatever genetic uh, augmentation you would have would sort of peter out. But to have a last name, La'an Noonien Singh, to me is a failure of creativity. Because immediately, as, as a matter of fact, most of Strange New Worlds is, is a failure of creativity because they co-opted characters from the original series rather than go back to the cage where Pike and Number One were from. No Ensign Colt, no Dr. Boyce. There was a lot of people they could have used. We know why they didn't, but still. So I'm watching this episode, um, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, which immediately I'm like, wow, you know, like everything else, let's use the same passage from Macbeth. But then you have to ask yourself, how does that really, other than the words tomorrow, how does that really refer back to what's going on in this episode? I mean, I guess you could obliquely figure out how to make sure that each day passes and it's neither a good day or a bad day. It's just another day or something if you wanted to. I mean, all our yesterdays fit a lot better because in the episode All Our Yesterdays, an entire planetary population... Uh, to escape a supernova and the destruction of, of everything, they all go back in time to various places in their planet's own past. So every day is different, and it's the good, it's the bad, it depends what happens. So the passage from Macbeth makes a lot more sense. Um, it seemed to me that that our writer, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Reed, probably Googled Shakespeare and time travel and came up with this passage. Said, oh, yeah, the word tomorrow's in it. That'll be cool. Maybe he looked into it further. I don't know. But so here's the thing. I don't understand you have this character law. And let's let's if you can get past the fact that it's really monumentally stupid. She's a descendant of Khan's and that they keep having to go back to Khan. They have to redo Khan and Into Darkness. There's like this one touchstone, which leads me to believe that the only people that the only it, they didn't actually watch the original show. They they just they just watched Wrath of Khan and they figured Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan is generally considered to be the best Star Trek movie, which means it must be the best Star Trek. So let's keep going back to this one movie and base everything we do on it which means everything you do that's based on Star Trek II is going to be stupid because you do not understand all of the things that were surrounding that movie. What's really interesting is that, just like this episode, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is not really about the conflict with Khan, Nooney, and Singh. It's really about Kirk coming to grips with middle age and about the life he's left behind, the life, the road not taken, it's about him. It's a personal story, and and it's about one of his failings was not checking on the progress of the seed he planted during Space Seed. And that was one of the things Spock says at the end of the episode, something about the effect uh, or the to the effect of 
it would be interesting to come back here and see the fruit which sprung from the seed you planted today. Uh, Nicholas Meyer, who's a classical literature fan, classical music fan, grew up in a family of artists, hung on that and said, ah, how interesting. And what he did was he understands that, yes, you can have a story about a conflict, but your protagonist, in the case of Star Trek II, the protagonist really is Kirk. And it is Kirk's story, and it's about Kirk coming to grips with many different things in his life. Now, with the story that we have about La'an, aside from the fact that she's once again dealing with her genetic heritage, which really received not much of a mention in the previous episode that was also about prejudice against genetically engineered beings. But anyway, uh, I digress. So the episode of her trying to come to, to understand how to relate to people and, and uh, all of that's great. But what would have been, I think, a better use of... You have 10 episodes of Strange New Worlds this season. One is a time travel riff, this one, on its City on the Edge of Forever meets Yesterday's Enterprise meets uh, Dolmer and Locke's, you know, the time, the time, <laughs> the time variance authority. Um, it, it, all of those things. You have a musical episode coming up. And then you have a crossover with an animated show. So I would say three of these these episodes are gimmick episodes. Spock turning gets to turn all human into in episode five. Not next week, but the week after, which is and meet his mother in law, which I would dare say is another gimmick episode. Where's the science fiction in this show? Where is the thoughtful, allegorical science fiction that's bold and brand new? Why don't we get any of that? But what this episode now does, and what makes it the most maddening to me at all, or most of all, and I want to read this article. Yes, that's true. I have an article to read. You knew I did. So here is uh, an article that came out today. How Star Trek Strange New World Season 2's latest episode majorly changed the timeline and what the showrunner had to say about it. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Let me just put up what he had to say about it. This is from Akiva Goldsman. This, meaning the episode, is a correction. Because otherwise, it's silly. Or Star Trek ceases to be in our universe ceases to be in our universe can i just say what the fuck star trek was never in our universe it's not supposed to be in our universe it's a tv show that we watch star trek is an alternate fictional universe that is telling a story about an alternate timeline an alternate version of earth that we aspire to hope earth becomes it's not about our earth it's not about us it's not about our history it shares our history but it's not our history and and the idea that we had no eugenics wars this let's we have to push it forward by changing star trek lore and star trek history all you do is betray the fact that you people and i mean you people you writers don't know what the fuck you're doing you don't know what the fuck you're doing you're trying to say this is a this is a canonical extension or prequel to the existing timeline and then at the very same time you say it isn't this is a correction because otherwise it's silly or star trek ceases to be in our universe by the way this happened in season one so this is not a season two issue it's a pilot issue we want star trek to be an aspirational future we want to be able to dream our way into the federation as a starfleet i think that's the fun of it in part And so, in order to keep Star Trek in our timeline, we continue to push dates forward. At a certain point, we won't be able to. Well, yeah, that's already happened, dumbass. Uh, 1992 to 1996. But at a certain point, we won't be able to. But obviously, if you start saying that the eugenics wars were in the 1990s, you're kind of fucked for aspirational in terms of the real world. Um, That's the dumbest shit I've ever heard. And I would expect nothing less from Akiva Goldsman, a man who's built his entire success on adapting the work of other people. 
We have yet to see an Academy Award-winning original screenplay from Akiva Goldsman. We have yet to see a great piece of genre entertainment that was an original thing created by Akiva Goldsman. The man might be good at adaptation, and even that is debatable. But I would say that Akiva Goldsman doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. The fact is, I understood Star Trek was aspirational because it's not about the tumult that it that we all have to live through. It's about we finally get to the utopian civilization. Everything that happened before the 23rd century is what got us there. I don't find Star Trek any less aspirational because in the Star Trek universe, the eugenics wars took place in 1999 or 1992 to 96. I find it more interesting that way because it's not our universe. I know that that didn't happen. We still might have the post-atomic horror. We didn't have the eugenics wars. The Starship Enterprise did not come back in time to our time, and I know that because the Starship Enterprise is made up. There are no Elorians on Earth because there are no Elorians. The race of listeners. Guinan was not hanging out with Mark Twain in San Francisco. The Vidians were not there either. Nor are there Borg bodies in the Arctic somewhere. I know they're not because I watch a fictional show called Star Trek that is made up by people. I've never once since the time I was five years old ever thought it was part of our world. You know, when I watch From the Earth to the Moon, I mean, pardon me, when I watch For All Mankind, From the Earth to the Moon is great too, but that's an actual docudrama about the Apollo program. But when I watch From the Earth to the Moon, I almost consider it with a few tweaks because they didn't have the eugenics wars in the 90s either. But to me, From the Earth to the Moon is a great prequel series to Star Trek. Prequel to Enterprise. Alternate history. The Russians landed on the moon before we did. It still, it still touches on our history. And, and it takes dates of things that actually happen and changes them. You know why? Because it's fucking fiction. That's why. That's why. So watching this show, I watch it as an old school Star Trek fan that has reference material on my shelf. And I understand that what, because by pushing these things, and I don't, this is not a review of, of the episode. I don't want to review the episode. I don't want to spoil the episode. But I'll tell you one thing, and this is a fucking huge spoiler. This whole episode could have been a really interesting character exploration of La'an and James T. Kirk. You know, if you want to do that, you want to explore their version of Kirk, which is, again, ridiculous. No offense to Paul Wesley. You can only do what he's been given. But, you know, this idea, the one clever thing in this episode of Star Trek that I thought was interesting is that Kirk was hustling chess players in the park. I like that Stanley Kubrick was a chess player. We know that Kirk is a master chess player. How do we know? Because he checkmated Spock in the very first episode they were in together, the second pilot of Star Trek, where no man has gone before. We know Kirk's a great chess player. That was clever. However, we also know, just at my joy of loving this, we also know that Kirk doesn't know how to fucking drive because we saw that in a piece of the action. You're an excellent starship commander, as Spock says. But, you know, his driving skills leave much to be desired. Except now uh, we have a Kirk that came from a devastated Earth that still knows how to drive a car. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm looking at these things and I think, did anybody actually watch the original series? Uh, not to, Mr. Reed, the writer of this episode, I'm sure he's a fine man. Have you watched all 79 episodes of Star Trek? Like, did you do your homework? Did you do your homework? Because I kind of feel when I watch this show that you didn't. And I don't understand if you're writing 10 episodes of Star Trek where are the meat and potatoes episodes? Like you're constantly, you're constantly doing things, a courtroom drama, which we've seen before. That's your second episode of the season. A very didactic, on the nose. I like the episode. It's my favorite episodic episode of Star Trek of the modern age. But even that was heavy-handed and hit you over the head. Like the performances, though. But, but I watched this episode, and they couldn't even give me an... Uh, from the very beginning, the title of the episode, an original Shakespeare quote. It's a Shakespeare quote that was already from a from actually from a passage that was already cited as a Star Trek episode title in 1969. And I'm sure that Mr. Reed probably wouldn't have titled that episode. Maybe he wanted to do it too, and 
but he just didn't know that there was a an all our yesterday's uh, title. Maybe he did. I mean, now I'm sure now. Not that he's watching this show, but I'm sure now he will. It'll it'll be a retcon of his work. He'll oh I I yeah, of course I knew all our yesterdays was an episode title. There's a lot of episode titles. Conscience of the King, a first season Star Trek episode. A lot of Shakespeare in uh, the original Star Trek, and people act like it's something new. People think it's an uh, a, a, the the uh, Shakespeare thing came from Picard. No didn't come from Picard but you know whatever uh it's just it's maddening to watch this and I think you know you have to ask yourself we as genre fans that watch science fiction fantasy and horror that are that are watching franchises that are 57 years old um what we want is greatness we want television and we want entertainment that is smartly written, that doesn't treat us like idiots. And I'll tell you something. If you're going to pull Shakespeare and you're going you're gonna to quote Macbeth, actual, not just from the, the play, but actually quote Macbeth, you better have a reason for doing it. It's not, it can't just be window dressing. You know, there's got to be a reason. And, and I guess you could tie into things and say, this is what this was supposed to be. But... I, I often feel that these episodes are written like if you were going to go in and and t- and and talk about Khan Noonie and sing, at least go to Memory Alpha and just look up the eugenics wars. There's a lot of information there that you could use to incorporate into your show, and people like me wouldn't go on the internet and bitch about it. And I feel like they don't even do that. There's so much reference material about Star Trek. And I've heard the writers bitch and say, sometimes your, you know, canon is very constricting. Well, if canon is constricting, then don't fucking refer back to it in your episode. Write an episode about La'an that's unique to your show. You know? And, and then even, even Pelia has to be a character. And I like Carol Kane. But even she's on Earth, too. I mean, I want to know if uh, how many aliens are on Earth in the 20th century or 21st century. How many people are just hanging out? H- how many? I don't know. Do you have to have every single female alien? Oh, yeah, she was on Earth. She's been on Earth for hundreds of years, too. Okay, so you're stealing the qualities of Guinan. Why are you doing that? You can do anything you want. You can create every episode of Strange New Worlds should be new. You shouldn't have to refer. You've already stolen Mbenga, Nurse Chapel, and you've already stolen, of course, Uhura. Well, and Pike in number one. Um, so... In, in already absconding with people you didn't create, they're not your characters. Half your show is not, they're not yours. Wouldn't you want to make sure that you're writing fiercely original scripts and stories that are reflective of today? And, and why is it that, let's go back to what Akiva Goldsman said. Let's go back to this quote. This is a correction because otherwise it's silly. Star Trek is silly. Your merch doesn't sell, buddy. You know, you, you, you haven't created a 57-year-old TV show, Akiva Goldsman. You adapted A Winter's Tale, one of my favorite books I've ever read, into one of the worst literary adaptations I've ever seen. Look good, though. Great cinematography. Um, how much did your cinematographer actually direct? Probably a lot, I would imagine. But, I mean, come on, dude. All of your success is built on adapting the work of others. Don't you want to have something fiercely original? You get the reins of a Star Trek show where you get to make 10 episodes a season. The original series of Star Trek, I mean, you're looking at 30, almost 30 episodes. I mean, and it started out as they were making Western shows, you know, Mud's Women. It's kind of a Western in space. But then they moved on and they told us some great, great, great stories. Where are these original stories? Why don't you do something where you don't refer back to previously existing Star Trek characters? Every single episode, you refer back to something. Now, now we're going to meet. You're going to meet Spock's in-laws because, I mean, I think it was pretty apparent that in the original series, Spock and Dupring didn't have such a great relationship. But now, since you've made Dupring uh, Spock's f- betrothed fuck buddy, you know, you you it, it, it just it's it's like. 
do we have to? And do I have to sit there and feel like, does Paramount know? Does CBS know? Do the rights holders pay any attention about how you're literally going out? And it's like J.J. Abrams saying, oh, I never liked Star Trek. It was too it was too cerebral for me. You know, my friends, all, we all like Star Wars. But Star Trek, I just, I just couldn't get into it. Oh, okay, here's $75 million to direct a Star Trek movie. I mean... Kiva Goldsman's, I like going to conventions. Okay, well, you're right. You can't do anything original. You just have to steal everyone else's shit. Why? Why do you do that? Give me an original, give me a shred of originality. I mean, you're going to have a musical episode. Oh, yeah, because, you know, Buffy did it. Okay, everyone's got to have a, after the, after, uh, uh, once more with feeling, everyone's got to do a musical episode. Of course, you could say that Cop Rock did it first. But still, let's have, let's have a musical Star Trek episode. Let's cross over with the animated series. Let's do that. So of your 10 episodes, how many are left that you can tell a really shatteringly original science fiction story? Well, I'd say none because no one's qualified there to write a shatteringly original science fiction story, which is really too bad. But um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what to say about that. But um, what can you do? I don't know. And it's just frustrating. Very, very frustrating. Um, I would like to read a, uh, I'd like to read a Tumblr, um, a Tumblr article that uh, I wrote um, a long time ago about Star Trek. And I have to find it. I don't know if, if I even can find it. Um, but I'll try and find it. Boy, I, I was looking up, I was looking this up on, um, uh, I was looking this up on um, uh, my Tumblr, my old Tumblr, because I wanted to read it. And I can't find it. I can't find my old Tumblr. So as, I, as I'm doing this live, I'm trying to find it. But I wanted to read if it'll... Um, Let's see. Um, let's see. I can't. I can't find it. Maybe I can't find it. Which I should have probably. I didn't think about this um, before I went on. But uh, but I wanted to read you when I heard that they were going to do Star Trek Discovery. I want to read you um, what I wrote, and um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, maybe I can. No, I guess I can't. Um, if I can. Mm, I can find... Uh, I guess I can't. Well, I'll tell you. In a... Uh, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I can find it now. Or maybe I can't find it. No, these are just all posts about me. Well, I can't. Long story short, what I was suggesting before Discovery came out, is Battlestar Galactica Star Trek. Like, reboot the whole thing from scratch. You can tell the stories of Kirk, Spock, McCoy, the Enterprise, the Federation, all of that. But start over from today and extrapolate a new future. Start from scratch. There is no Star Trek. Go back to square one. Because Star Trek was really, ultimately, it is a a period piece in two ways. It's a period piece about a future that never existed, but it's also written from the perspective of the 1960s, the Camelot era, the Kennedy era, the, 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 this, all of this hope and these dreams in the wake of all of this tumult and civil unrest, Vietnam War, things like that. So our future science was unknown. We've made a lot of advances. A lot of our technology is already caught, caught up to Star Trek. So why is it that somebody can't start the Star Trek universe over? Meaning, let's take where humanity is now and extrapolate out about the Star Trek universe and start over. The same way that Ron Moore and David Icke started over with Battlestar Galactica. And I know there's a lot of Battlestar Galactica purists out there, but the thing was, the Battlestar Galactica TV series was never very good. It was, it was written in the wake of Star Wars. It was written by somebody who had Mormon leanings, and that's not a slur or that's not a slight. It, it just was. That was the truth. And there's a lot of Mormonism within the first, that only season of Battlestar Galactica until they got to Galactica 1980. 
But why not do that? Why turn around and say that we are going to change Star Trek? Why bother? I mean, it just angers people and it diminishes. You're, you're diminishing the original series with each one of these episodes. You're taking away, and, and in this, this episode, you've diminished not only the original series, you've diminished Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. The character of La Nuni and Singh is a diminishment of Khan Nuni and Singh and Space Seed. Christina Chong, the actress, again, is great. I actually, she's like my favorite character on the show. Um, and not just because she's hot, but I think she's a good actress and I like that she's playing this certain character. But she's faced off against our stupid xenomorph Gorns. They ruin the Gorns. They retcon the Gorns. And ah, it just drives me crazy. And the question is, is it so important? It is important because why is it important? I found this article. I found this article. Uh, and it's, it's, it's an NYU faculty teaching and learning resource about stories. What stories can do. And I guess, you know, the NYU, if you're a, a professor at NYU, you read this faculty resource book and they have the purpose of stories. Literally, seriously. Uh, stories can serve several functions in the sequence of your lessons. So this is, this is why storytelling is important, according to a college. Make the subject accessible to students. Stories can be used to explain and illustrate abstract ideas or concepts in a way that makes them accessible and attainable. Stories bring facts to life, make the abstract concrete, and through meaning-making, walk the listener through the mind of the scientist or mathematician to understand the value and application of such concepts. Wells argued that storytelling is a fundamental means of making meaning. Teachers are experts in their field and as a result are accustomed to sophisticated language, build stronger schema and memory, making knowledge easier to recover. In a study by Bannister and Ryan, children remembered abstract science ideas more effectively when taught in a story format. Remembering isolated and disconnected facts and concepts is more difficult than recalling this type of content in a story because the information is presented in a coherent and connected way. Assimilate new ideas and build a path to understanding. Using stories as a way to provide students with their first exposure to complex or abstract concepts can help assimilate the new information and build a strong path towards understanding the continuation of learning, of learning events that build upon these learning blocks. Reduce resistance or anxiety to learning. Presenting instructional content in the form of a story can help students overcome intimidation with complex abstract concepts. Stories can be non a non, stories can be a non-threatening way of presenting the information to students. Um, I would say that that is exactly what Star Trek should be doing. Unfortunately, the people that are writing Star Trek are not college professors, much to my chagrin. If only they could bring that knowledge and incorporate those that knowledge into a great science fiction story, we'd be doing quite well. But unfortunately, we're not. You know why we're not? Let's go back. Because this is a correction. Meaning, this is a correction from the original series. Because otherwise, it's silly. Of course it's silly, just like the original series is, right? Or Star Trek ceases to be in our universe, which it never was. Dumbass. By the way, this happened in season one, so this is not a season two issue. It's a pilot issue. Yeah, it's your lack of understanding and creativity. It's not a Star Trek or a pilot issue. It's a you issue, Akiva Goldsman. You are not creative enough to make it work. All you can ever do is adapt other people's work. You can't create something good on your own. And I feel that I'm, I can say that. Go look at his IMDb. How much of it are literary adaptations of other people's great work? Most of it. Most of it. What did he win an Academy Award for? For adapting a beautiful mind. Didn't write it himself. He's good at copying other people's ideas and translating him into screenplay format. Sometimes. He also wrote the Lost in Space movie in Batman and Robin, lest we not forget. You know who never wrote Batman and Robin? Gene Roddenberry, Gene Kuhn, Dorothy Fontana, David Gerald, Ron Moore. You know, Akiva, Goldsman, you did. 
I received Bear didn't. Robert Hewitt Wolf didn't. But you did. Batman and Robin. Forever. Um, but it just... Should I read the NYU thing again? No, I don't have to. You get the point. I just... I'm tired of watching my favorite franchise being abused. And I felt it has been abused since 2009 by people that think that they can do better. That's the problem. They think they can do better. Well, you know what? The only people that had Star Trek canceled after one season, and it's sad because it was Prodigy, which was actually pretty good, is Akiva Goldsman. Well, it's really Alex Kurtzman, but Secret Hideout. Congratulations, Secret Hideout. You're the only people that got a Star Trek series canceled after one season. Anyway, let's see what you all have to say uh, in this chat because I I grow weary. Uh, Sean Omomia. Uh, Rob, it's simple. All of our beloved IP are gone because they're owned by a corporation. Think back to all the famous IPs that were made by individuals with a vision or a small group of people. I feel like we're losing true creativity. See, but the problem with Star Trek is it's been abandoned by its corporation that owns it. The, the corporation, on a spreadsheet, they're like, oh, okay, Akiva Goldsman, he's won an Academy Award, he's adapted. Look at all these movies he's worked on. Or Alex Kurtzman. On paper, it looks to the corporation that they've made something good. I would, I would say, gosh, these people that we hired to make Star Trek, they're the first people that had a Star Trek show canceled. Star Trek fans, our core audience, did not watch Star Trek Prodigy. Why? Because Star Trek Prodigy was the first Star Trek series that was directed at children. Why people thought that show had to get made? The irony is that it was a good show. But the thing is, kids don't fucking watch Star Trek anymore. You know why? I started watching the original series when I was five years old. If you're five years old and you watch Star Trek Discovery, what the fuck would you come back for? What is that show saying to you? Uh, other than the fact that uh, I have no connection to this, I'm bored by this, I'm not excited by this at all. I mean, the real question is you have to ask yourself, why isn't Star Trek in the top echelon of TV? Picard Season 3 got up there, but why isn't Star Trek? Because it's not good. It doesn't connect with its audience. And that's not to say if you like it, it's not connecting with you, but it's not collecting en masse. It's not a water cooler show. So, but Sean, I take your point. Um, uh, Eloy Diaz has been a member for nine months. Thanks, Eloy. I like that. Uh, reference to the time machine. Paul in Long Beach. Um, <laughs> Paul in Long Beach says, just a reminder, my friend, Rob Observations episode one was on August 1st, 2018. We're almost five years. Time to start planning a good party. Oh, I didn't know that. Half a decade. August 1st. But you know what? That that was a different... That was when I did my documentary show. with that. I was uh, edited together. It's pretty cool, by the way. Uh, NKS432 says, Rob, I'm so tired of creatives ruining franchises because they don't understand the source materials. Here and Rings of Power and a certain KK. Well, it is getting tiresome. I mean, uh, to be honest, it's, it's, it's really getting tiresome watching these franchises get ruined because they're not that hard to figure out. That's that's the frustrating part. It's frustrating when I have hundreds of books, Star Trek novels. There's Star Trek novel series that they could adapt, the Vanguard series that David Mack wrote on. Peter David wrote a great New Frontiers series about Captain Mackenzie Calhoun, which is a great name for a captain, and uh, great series. There's so much Star Trek that they could adapt, and now they just steal bits and pieces of it. And if, there's, if their characters were great, if their stories were great, I wouldn't care. I'd be like, this is awesome. But they're not. They're all derivative. Akiva Goldsman doesn't know how to write something fiercely original. Everything is derivative. I'm going to create a character. I'm going to create a character that's, 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 that's going to be based. What if it's a descendant of Khan? <laughs> Isn't that creative? No. No, it's not. Create an original character, an original backstory, an original alien from an original planet. And, and you know, let's see, we need big bands. What are we going to use? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, well, let's not create something new. Let's, let's use the Gorn. 
You know what? The Gorn's always like, huzz, huzz. he plays video games with Shatner on, on couches now, so we have to make it cool. Let's use the Gorn and turn them into, wait a minute, wait, wait, I can't come up with any good original ideas what we're going to do with the Gorn. <gasps> let's make them xenomorphs. Yeah, let's, let's have them, like, have the same life cycle as the alien. Because that's cool. It's also unoriginal, just like the rest of your fucking show is. Let's have the captain will cook for ensigns and everybody and have to cook for Spock because Spock is such a moron that he never learned to cook growing up. And, and Dr. Mbenga because he knows Vulcans, hey, here, have a heart, play some music. Spock was a fucking child prodigy. He, know how to, he knows how to cook. He also knows how to play music. You know why? Because he learned those things growing up. Why? Because he's awesome. He had to be the best man on both worlds. He had to be the best Vulcan and he has to be the best human without being saddled with any of emotions. Come on, man. And all you do is make Spock, oh, uh, we're going to teach him. We humans are going to teach Spock everything he needs to know. The whole point was that Spock had something to teach us, even though he had no emotions. Uh, they reversed that. Stephen Langford says, did you buy the Kino Lober 4K physical release of the original Death Wish with Charles Bronson? Uh, yes. Actually, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't buy it. They sent it to me. Uh, I, and I grew up with Death Wish. I think they're putting out Death Wish 5 even. Look, do I think that its messaging is not necessarily um, something we want for the present day? Yes, but Death Wish is a classic. Classic. Total classic. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Louise X. Sparrow, our own Louise X. Sparrow, says, I belong to a Trek writing RPG online. We kept track of real canon and our own canon, and we ran it as ships in character. Our stories were better. Can you imagine if you worked for Star Trek Online? Star Trek Online actually did a marvelous job continuing canon until modern Star Trek started. And then they have to incorporate all this bullshit and make it work. It's so stupid. I feel sorry for those guys. I really do. But I'll tell you one thing. Uh, this is kind of funny. If you go to Eagle Moss, uh, Master Replicas is selling the Eagle Moss spaceships. The Star Trek Online ships always outsell the Discovery or uh, 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 Strange New World ships. Always. Maybe with the exception of the Cerritos, because, you know, everyone likes that, don't they? Sure. Um, John Cross says, hey, Rob, not Star Trek talk, but have you been watching Secret Invasion? Absolutely. The second episode of Secret Invasion dropped. I Look, I'd read the scripts of Secret Invasion. I really liked Secret Invasion, uh, both episodes. And, um, yeah, watch out. Keep, keep your eye out on Nick, uh, Nick Fury's wife, by the way. <clears throat> Surprising revelation there. But not what you think it is. Um, I, I thought the second episode was better than the first. Really, really liking it. It's hardcore. It's good. I like it. Um, so, yeah. I think it's great. And I'll tell you something. I think as the I, I agree with you. As an MCU show, I think it's probably the best one. And it keeps getting better. It sticks the landing. It really does. And if you're a fan, a fan, it's very Tom Clancy-esque in its conception. And I like it for that reason. And I think it works. Uh, Rob Biller says, 100% on everything, but feeding off what you've previously said, do you think this showrunner or writers could pull off a competent reboot? As my favorite Star Trek author is known for saying, but I digress. So you're talking about Peter David. Um, I Here's the thing. You know, Peter David, like David Mack, who came after him, was great at working in canon, and Peter David did create the Mackenzie Calhoun, the, the New Frontiers series, which was quite good. If you guys want to read a really great, I think it's a really great Star Trek series that has the tone that they're actually looking for, the modern tone of what they're going for, the, the New Frontiers series is, is really quite good. And, and it's right there. I mean, that's the frustrating thing. It's right there. And by the way, they don't even fucking know that exists. I mean, I would have taken that series, that book series, and pitched it. And somebody would have said, well, it already belongs to Peter David, so, you know, we can't use it. Or they would have said, we already own it, so we can pay We don't have to pay him shit. But I'll tell you, if they went and, and New Frontiers would have been a great Star Trek New Frontiers. There's your title right there. I mean... It, strange New Worlds, again, they can't do anything original, you know, to seek out Strange New Worlds, they can't do that. Um, just like the title of this week's episode comes from the same passage of Macbeth that all our yesterdays came from as a title. 
Yeah. But do I think that the writers today... No, the writers today can't because they, they, they just aren't seasoned enough. They haven't... The, the TV writers of today have not lived enough life. They, have, they don't have a lot to say. All they're doing is regurgitating other TV shows or other movies they've seen. There's no literary concepts. I mean, that's what's so frustrating. I, I would love it if somebody actually... It's, it's very apparent the original Star Trek series had actual science fiction writers. Writers who had written novels. I mean, hell, you'd think that Akiva Goldsman... Akiva Goldsman has adapted Richard Matheson, who wrote episodes of the original series. He wrote I Am Legend that Akiva Goldsman adapted for the Will Smith movie. Uh, dare I say, uh, maybe badly, <laughs> even though I kind of like that movie. Francis Lawrence, I thought, was an interesting... He did a good job. Um, Alexander Wilson says, Have you finished The Bear yet? I have not. I haven't watched any, hardly any TV at all except Black Mirror. So I'll tell you that uh, right away. So... You know, um, it's it's not to belabor these points, but I think all of our franchises have a fundamental problem, and I don't necessarily think it's the corporations that own them. Uh, I think that was part of the reason with Star Wars. I think that I'm a Kathleen Kennedy supporter. I think Kathleen Kennedy was hampered by what Disney expected from Star Wars. I mean, I I honestly, and it, it, it you know she tried to do things like Lord Miller directing Solo. That was a really interesting choice. You know, it really was. Um, it didn't work out. But, you know, this Dial of Destiny, everyone's like, oh, it might be the final nail in the Kathleen Kennedy coffin. Well, it's kind of sad because everybody, I love James Mangold. Kathleen Kennedy, I grew up with movies she produced. I mean, this is her 41st year as a producer. And um, she's she's and her husband, Frank Marshall. Frank Marshall was in, of course, Raiders and has a big connection to that film, worked on it. Uh, I, I don't, it gives me no pleasure to see these franchises regurgitated over and over and over and over and over again, especially by people, you're not going to not take the job. You're going to take the job, but unfortunately, it's it's maddening to watch a science fiction show have no science fiction in it, other than time travel, and it's, look, here's the thing about time travel, and and. Uh, again, I feel like here's here's if I were if I was teaching a college course on time travel, here's here's what I would say. I'd say, class, why are we fascinated by time travel stories? What is it about them? Well, all time travel stories. The reason the time travel stories appeal to us is because we, all of us, wish that at some point in our lives we could go back in time and change a choice that we've made. That's why people love time travel stories, because we're living vicariously through characters. They've gone back in time, and sometimes, like as in Back to the Future, uh, going back in time was sort of an accident or, or something. If you get thrown back in time and it's accidental, then something happens to you back there where you, you have to preserve your own existence, the grandfather paradox. But if you intentionally travel through time, like for instance, let's take a Star Trek example. One of the great time travel stories of all time. Dr. McCoy has a cortisone injection and inadvertently, because he's out of his mind, jumps through the Guardian of Forever and changes the past, which means the Federation doesn't exist. The entire history that allowed the Federation and Kirk to exist and everybody to exist is gone. So the rest of the landing party is now forced to go back in time and reset. Not, not, it's not a multiverse they have to reset their own existence. And as Kirk says, everybody, if they don't come back, everybody has to go through and try. So what's very interesting is by going back in time, trying to find Dr. McCoy, that, that's a story unto itself. But what, what makes the story even more interesting is that something happens, and this is what makes time travel stories interesting too, something happens when you go back in time to you as a main character that you're not expecting. And in this case, what they aren't expecting is for Kirk to fall in love. And Kirk falls in love, ironically, which is what makes it a great time travel story, he falls in love with the very person that is the focal point in time that they were looking for. And inadvertently, McCoy going back in time stopped Edith Keeler from dying. And she was allowed to grow and become a 
peacenik and a and an activist and and basically stopped America's entry into World War II, changing all of human history. But that's the focal point in time, and Kirk falls in love with her, and Kirk has to let her die in order to preserve the timeline. That's a genius science fiction story, set up and pay off in 52 minutes, in and out, good night, Irene. Fantastic. A time travel story has to be personal to the character in order for it to be good. The problem with tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow is that it's all made up gobbledygook. A time traveling agent shows up and gives La'an a thing and tells her to go back here. And when you get into the past, a bridge is blowing up. Oh, we don't know. Oh, there's aliens on Earth. And uh oh, we didn't know that. And there's uh, apparently Toronto's a hotbed of genetic engineering and cold fusion. Who knew that? Uh, and and there, so when you're watching this episode, you're asking yourself, what is this episode about? And, and the episode is constantly throwing stuff at you because it's not focused. Not to, not to you know, detract from David Reed's writing ability, but the real episode, the question of that episode that's posed in the very beginning is La'an is aloof. She doesn't have many friends. She has certainly no intimate partners. She's, she's somebody who's withdrawn and she's got to open up. She's got to learn to open up. And they decided to give her this time travel adventure. But the thing is, None of it, none of what was going on was personal to her until this third act twist. So it's a bad time travel story. And I'll tell you why it's a bad time travel story. It's a bad Star Trek story. Because it, <laughs> so what they want to do is, of course, they don't, th there is a misconception that Kirk is, the, like every episode of Star Trek, he slept with some chick. You know, he's a, he was a bone daddy. And the thing is, that's not true. If you look at the women that Kirk was involved with, especially women from his past, for the most part, they were either tentacled aliens from Andromeda that took the form of human beings. They were uh, very sophisticated androids that were devastatingly intelligent. They were lawyers. They were, they were women of, of Ruth, who's in shore leave, incredibly elegant. I mean, whenever you saw the women from Kirk's past, uh, they weren't like some trashy lady that they, he picked up leaning against a jukebox at 2 o'clock in the morning when the bar was closing. I mean, Kirk was a man of exceptional taste. And, and you know, they even play off a scene where Lon, I mean, and I'm sure they did this on purpose. There's a scene where Lon could have hooked up with Kirk. But they play it like she walks into his room, looks over, understands they're in a situation where they might die or be white from existence. And they could have found comfort in one another's arms. Nope, not in our Star Trek show. We're not going to have Kirk sleep with one of our main characters. What kind of show is this? Who is this for? I don't know. Anyway, um, Tom Jr. Jackson says, hey, I'm showing support. Um, yeah. Um, Greggy Gilgan says, since you mentioned indie, I saw it and I really enjoyed it. Many positive comments online from others seeing it too. I feel you might enjoy it also. Well, I think it's not surprising to me that people like it because nothing, even the people that talk about their the things they don't like about it, I'm like, that doesn't sound like I wouldn't like it. <laughs> I, I'm, I mean, it's an Indiana Jones movie. I mean, I'm a guy, I didn't like Last Crusade very much. So what does that say about me? Probably a lot of people are like, what? It's the best indie movie. That's like saying Return of the Jedi is the best Star Wars movie. A lot of people say it. It just isn't true. It's, it, it's when you saw it, which I understand. So, <laughs> uh, Michael Nemo says, I just had someone online tell me that City on the Edge of Forever is the height of misogyny as the woman has to die for all men to live. See, this is the problem with the modern age. That, that, and this is why so, many writing, so much writing today is terrible, because people are looking at stories through their own activism. Somebody who says that, that's all performance, uh, a performative active, uh, activism. Uh, they're looking at like that way. No, the, 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 what, what they're doing is a man in love. First of all, our, our main characters, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the original Star Trek, are men. They are men that are going back in time, and they're meeting a woman if you look at her, she is a smart, devastatingly intelligent woman that sees a future that might not come to pass, but she believes in it. A future of nuclear power, a future of uh, humanity amongst the stars. And she's out there uh, uh, helping the poor and the downtrodden, the people that drink from the wrong bottle. 
you know, she's a, an incredible character. And to have Kirk fall in love with her, what you have to do is the stakes have to be so high. That's the point of the story. But for somebody to say this, that is an easy, quick, uninformed opinion. And there is no misogyny in the episode. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. Because you're dealing in the 60s, you're seeing a, a, an incredibly powerful woman. The portrayal of Edith Keeler is an amazing portrayal, especially on 60s television. But you know what? Idiot activists, man, all they see is because they want to, you know, they want to make sure that they're they're getting those brownie points. I mean, it, it's it's it, it's amazing because you can't you can't look at the the at Star Trek and you're like, let's judge Star Trek by the lens of today. Let's not think about the fact that it's over half a century old. You know, I mean, why don't you worry more about the fact that the Supreme Court rescinded affirmative action, which. I think is a devastating blow and it says terrible things about our country. Do I believe in a meritocracy? Yes, but there's a lot of people that don't even have the opportunity to show their own merits and that's what affirmative action is all about. And our Supreme Court got rid of it. Why was it even challenged? I mean, I get why it was challenged, but we should worry about other things. But yep, gone. Um, but yeah, like in terms of indie, I think I will enjoy it. I, I, I honestly believe that I'll probably enjoy Indiana Jones. I really do. Uh, Jeff Yerke and Mrs. Y. Uh, Mrs. Yerke and Mr. Yerke are here. Hi, Rob. Long time no speak. We are working our way through every single Kurosawa film on Criterion. Uh, you must have that DVD collection. I wish they would put it out on Blu-ray or CD. Also, I am so done with Star Trek. I know, I keep saying that, but you know like me, you have to watch it. By the way, I, I flaked at not getting back to you. I've been so busy at doing all these other things and finishing up this movie. A movie called The White Devils, I'm sure people will love, that I have not been doing as much as I should to start this panel show. But, um, yeah, I, I th th again, time travel. You can't even tell a, a focused, interesting time travel story. I mean, I get it, but, you know, I don't think I've watched a time travel story that's more sort of lackadaisical uh, because they didn't know what they were doing back in time. I will say this, too. You know what was one of the more interesting ideas? And, of course, the Orville did this better this season. And wasn't there an Orville episode called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow? And I'm sure it was called that because Seth MacFarlane knew that All Our Yesterdays was a Star Trek title. So he did Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow. I think. I don't know. I can't remember. But um, there's an episode of the Orville from the third season where they have a really interesting time travel conundrum. And I don't want to ruin it for anybody because it's really an interesting show. And they kind of touched on it, and I thought it would be really interesting. So there's an alternate universe that's created. That's why La'an is on the Enterprise commanded by Kirk. And there is they don't do much with this, but the idea that whose alternate universe gets to survive? Who's to say, like, if I had made the show, if they were really clever, if they were really clever in this episode, it would have been La'an, Nuni, and Singh that was erased from existence. And they go back, and the Enterprise was now under the command of Kirk, not under the command of Pike. The Gorns were back being a proud spacefaring race. They're not just ripoffs of Xenomorphs, and they would have turned the show into the original Star Trek, which is what they're trying to do anyway. But it would have been horrible moving forward, and I might have liked it momentarily, but it would have been terrible in the long run. So it's probably best they didn't do that. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to end this show, but I want you to all watch this. I encourage you to watch Strange New Worlds. There's a lot of people that really liked it, and I understand where they're, where they're coming from, but, you know, read Donna Tartt's The Secret History. It's not even a science fiction novel. Just read it because it's a great book. But I, I, would, I, would, I would implore people, you know, go out and find some classic science fiction and read. You guys want to read a really interesting, fun time travel book that the time travel is done in an interesting way. Here, here, here's a Rob's book club for you. Go find Ken Grimwood's book, Replay, and read it. I guarantee you it'll be one of the most memorable time, time travel stories you'll ever read. If you read Ken Grimwood's book, Replay, if you don't know the book, and by the way, don't even read what it's about. Don't go look it up on Wikipedia. Just listen to your Uncle Bob here. Uncle Robbie, Uncle RMB, go get Ken Grimwood's book replay and just fucking read it. 
and and don't read anything about it. Don't read the back of the book. Don't read shit about this book. Just go read it, and I'll tell you what. Give me 20 pages. Read 20 pages of that book. If you're not invested in 20 pages, write me back and go, hey, Rob, not going to listen to your book club recommendations anymore. I'm telling you, go get Ken Grimwood's book, Replay, and read it. It's really good, and it's very thought-provoking, and um, I guarantee you'll like it. Zachary Zabaley says, on Red Letter Media, whether Rich Evans believes Short Round was the planned getaway driver in Temple of Doom, Mike Stoklas, I, I love Mike, who is a huge Temple of Doom fan, said Short Round was just there by chance. Um, well, I, I, I would say he was not there by chance because he had the block, uh, uh, there's yarn, yarned to his foot. Short Round was always there. Why was Short Round always there? Because nobody would suspect him because he was a kid, so he was inconspicuous. So obviously Indiana Jones needed him to make a quick getaway. So Short Round was the person that was least, because they knew he was coming. You know, Lao Che knew he was coming, knew he was going to bring Nuwachi. So I would say that that uh, Indiana Jones had the most inconspicuous person, a kid waiting for his dad in the car. Why would anybody... Um, why would anybody uh, uh, be suspecting him? I don't think that they would. So, I, 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 a sh- short round was the planned getaway driver. St- I think so. Star Trek Late Night says, I went on a 30-minute rant back and forth about what timeline we're actually in here. I'm lost. What the fuck is Akiva doing? They need to hire some new people to write this crap. Terry, where are you? Well, here's the thing. I I just think that Akiva doesn't really think through a lot of what he writes. There's not a lot of connective tissue in any of this. You know, you read it and you ask yourself, what what is going on here? And here's the thing. When you're writing science fiction and you, you ask yourself, okay, if A is true and B is true and C is true, then D, E, and F must also be true. The problem is... I feel like when I'm watching modern Star Trek, they don't think about D, E, and F. And I'll, a perfect example of that, and I use this all the time, in Star Trek 09, the villain Nero, who has Borg technology on his mining ship, if you read the comic book prequel, uh, Countdown, you have a character that is mad about the destruction of his homeworld. He ends up back in time 100 years, which rather than running through Captain Rubo, he could have just asked him and figured this stuff out. And knowing that he's gone back in time a hundred years. Rather than be mad, he could literally go to his own Romulan homeworld and warn his own planet that a hundred years hence, the Hobus star is going to go Nova and destroy, the, destroy Romulus. He doesn't do that. And so, so when you're watching that movie, an astute viewer of science fiction would go, okay, uh, Nero is pissed, Nero, for fuck's sake, Nero is pissed that Romulus is destroyed. He goes back in time and never once in the entire movie thinks to himself, and neither do any of the Star Trek characters. People can be like, whoa, 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 why are you, you're mad at Ambassador Spock. No one stops and goes, why are you mad? Perhaps we can help. What's your beef, buddy? Nobody does that, because if they did that, they wouldn't have a movie. That's why I hate Star Trek 09. It's a monumentally stupid film with a stupid villain that does stupid things the whole time. From the very beginning, your Nero rams a, a, a pike through Captain Rabao, killing him. What a stupid thing to do. Why would you do that? I mean, you don't know anything about where you're at. You're obviously, you can analyze the starship technology of the day and realize this is a 100-year-old starship. It's, we're completely, completely destroyed at any time. Uh, but no. And, and as a Star Trek fan, I watched... Star Trek 09, and I'm like, this villain's dumb. This movie's, by, by definition, the movie's then dumb, so I can't watch the rest of it. And that's modern Star Trek for you. They never think it through. It's bad science fiction. It's not even science fiction. It's, it's, it's fantasy written by people that don't read fantasy or science fiction, and it's maddening. It's maddening. And I hate it. <laughs> so uh, pick up a science fiction book. There's a lot of them out there, you know? Um, but anyway, I feel like 
I can't keep ranting about Star Trek, but then they keep putting out, look, I'll tell you, I'm going to come back and say episode five of Star Trek Strange New Worlds when they bring to Pring back, you know, and they bring her mother-in-law back and Spock. I mean, what is, what, what if we made Spock human? Okay. They do that. Like he's physically turned in full human. But we saw that again in the first season of the original series. Okay, he wasn't physiologically, magically changed, in, although they do have a good reason uh, why he's a full human. I'll buy that. But we saw that. What, what happens when Spock becomes a full human? Um, this side of paradise, the Leela Colomi episode, where Spock gets to fall in love. And at the end of the episode, he says, for a moment I was happy. It'll get, that episode will kill you. That episode is infinitely more intelligent and infinitely more adult than the fifth episode of Strange New Worlds. And again, I feel like Strange New Worlds is the YA version of Star Trek. It's the fast food drive through of Star Trek. I said that before in one of my rants. And nothing dissuades me from it. And I, it could be a great show. They've got the right actors if they want them. But this weird idea of the relationship, the developing romance between Christine Chapel and Spock, I, I mean, it was so much more adult in the original series. Watch This Side of Paradise. If you, want, if you want to see the definitive episode of what would happen if Spock became a human, watch This Side of Paradise. It is infinite, and because it's actually shot on location, it's infinitely more watchable than, say, for, especially for modern audiences, than watching a planetary set that is clearly stage bound. Watch that episode. Do, do again another another exercise. Watch the Paradise Syndrome. Or pardon me, that's third season. Watch this side of Paradise, and then go back and watch or go and watch the fifth episode where Spock gets to meet his fucking mother in law, and what goes on in that episode. And why do they have to make all the why are, why are all the the Vulcans just like dicks? You know, Celia Lofsky, when they introduced her in Amok Time as T'Pau, she wasn't a dick. But when McCoy is saying, he, he needs to rest, he can't breathe, and she's like, the air is the air of Vulcan. I mean, she's not being a dick. She's just stating the obvious. Like, what'd you expect? You're here. You know, you came here. You didn't know you were going to be in this battle to the death, but hey, you're here. Logically, you knew it could have happened, or you wouldn't be here. She didn't know they didn't know. So, I mean, ugh gets me mad science lady science lady's here science lady says i'm back from a nightclub Ooh, sorry i missed your rant i'm not as young as i used to be rob neither am i <laughs> how did we all manage staying out till 5 a.m when we were kids i hope this message makes you laugh it does uh it, it does make me laugh but we were able to stay out till five in the morning because you and i probably would have found each other in the club and we would have stayed up drinking uh, I don't know where you are, but if you just got back from a nightclub, I would assume that you're in Europe. And if you're in Europe, that means we probably could have been drinking, I don't know, tall the gin and tonics in those tall cylindrical glasses that they have in Europe, or whatever your drink of choice is. Um, and you and I would have met one another, because you're the science lady. And uh, it would have been fun. But we have to get old. We're not that old. I can still stay up five till five in the morning. Um, anyway... <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, but other than that, I think I'm going to end this stream. It's just what I want. I just, oh, I'm so tired of thinking about this. You know, I feel like I need to go to therapy or something. I need, I need Star Trek therapy. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just enough to talk to you guys, but it gets to the point where I, I get so angry. I, I never thought, I never thought I'd want to go see an Indiana Jones movie. Cause I think it would take my mind off how much Star Trek pisses me off. But here we are. So <laughs> on that note, I want to thank my moderating staff. I want to thank Justin Toner, who's here. I want to thank Louise, uh, Louise X Sparrow. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson. And I want to thank all of you for generously supporting the channel via Super Chats and Tips and all of that. And, um, yeah, I want to thank you. And, gosh, what else can I say other than... Uh, Oh, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. 
Actually, they pulled me back in because I've seen all, uh, uh, up through episode six. So there's only four more episodes of season I haven't seen. One's a musical and one's a crossover with an animated show, which also involves time travel. Great. Great. Where's the meat? Where's the taste of Armageddon? Where's the meat and potatoes episodes of Star Trek? Brand new science fiction concepts that were written. Where's the meta fucking morphosis? Scott Mance's favorite episode. Where's metamorphosis? Where's their version of, well, no, don't, I can't even say that. I don't want their version of the Doomsday Machine or the Immunity Syndrome or Operation Annihilate. I want something new. Tell me a new allegorical story that has some insight into the human condition for me. You know, I mean, really, I'm tired of watching shows, Star Trek shows about characters. I don't feel I really belong. I mean, how many, why is it, I mean, at, at the end of this episode, the, at the end of the day, it's all about La'an trying to feel better about herself. What, what the fuck is she in Starfleet for? Why do all these characters, I mean, let's see characters that are really good at their jobs, that really know what they're doing, get involved in adventures, where the crux of it isn't them feeling bad about themselves. I'm so tired of that. That's so of today. It's so short-sighted. But anyway, on that note, I'm going to go. Remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen, except to the writers of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, because they have nothing new to tell you. Maybe one day they will, but not today.